You ready for more comedy? Yes! This next comedian is amazing, but first I would like to say a quick thank you to our sponsor, Showtime. They have a uh, fun show called I'm Dying Up Here, which just premiered and it comes on Sundays at 10, 9 central. So please tune in. Our next comedian is a writer for Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Please put your hands together for Josh Gondelman. <laughs> Perfect. Hello, everyone. I, I like your energy. This is what I'm like all the time. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, this I'm gonna. I'm, my life's pretty good. I'm gonna talk about that for several minutes, and then we'll part ways probably forever. <laughs> That's my itinerary for the evening. Uh, I just got married three weeks ago, which is very exciting. Thank you. You guys are so sweet to say so. Uh, my, it's, I love it, and in 2017, I'm just excited not to be dating casually, because in, in this day and age, if you're just dating a little bit uh, and not locking it down, someone can just break up with you by not texting back. <laughs> Welcome to the future. It's worse than science fiction thought. <laughs> it happened to my friend. She was like, Josh, I went on three dates with a guy. I thought it was going great. Then I never heard from him again. He ghosted on me. That's the word for that, right? Ghosting. But that's the wrong term for that phenomenon because that is not how ghosts behave. <laughs> when there's a ghost in your life, he stays in touch. He's gonna bang your pots and pans together, flick your lights on and off. Ghosts are needy, they want your attention. They'll text you twice in a row if they have to. Ghosts don't give a fuck, they're already dead and they love drama, that's their shit. <laughs> If you're gonna tell me a story that ends, he ghosted on me, that's gonna be a better tale. That story's gotta go, Josh. I went on three dates with a guy. I thought it was going great. Now, every night at the stroke of 12, I hear a blood curdling scream that I don't understand. And I'd be like, oh buddy, he ghosted on you. I'm so sorry to hear that. He must have had unfinished business with an ex. Or it could be like, Josh, I was uh, flirting with a woman online. I thought I'd show up in person for the first date, like a gentleman, old school. I rang the doorbell. Answering the door was an old woman sobbing. I was like, uh, I'm sorry, is Megan there? And she's like, Megan? Megan's been dead for 30 years! Dude, you got ghosted, and that is a bummer, but you should not have signed up for Tinder on that burial ground. That's your fault, nobody else's. My wife's a big reader. And uh, I'm a better person because of her. I'll say that. My wife's a big reader, and I've been going through her favorite authors to learn a little bit about how she sees the world. And I recently came across a famous feminist quotation by Canadian writer Margaret Atwood, which is probably how many of your favorite jokes start. <laughs> and Margaret Atwood once wrote, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid men will kill them. Wow, weird laugh. <laughs> Generally, that's a heavy thing to say, right? And I don't know how to feel about that as a man who is also afraid that men will kill him. <laughs> Worst case scenario, while a woman laughs, if I'm being totally honest. I sleep fully clothed, because my biggest fear in the world is that I get out of bed to get a glass of water in the middle of the night, and while I'm walking back, burglar breaks in, ready to take all our stuff, but before he does, he sees my naked body and just goes, weird dick, loser, bang, and that's it for me, I'm done. Then my wife wakes up giggling, like, he did have kind of a weird dick. And then they get married to each other. And then I spend all eternity in that apartment ghosting them, like, every dick is kind of a weird dick, boo! <laughs> anyway, that's why I'm a feminist. That's my journey. <laughs> I proposed, that's the whole story. That's how it happens when you're a guy, right? I think it's a great injustice that we tell little girls how exciting it is to have a wedding and how fulfilling it is to be married. And then when they grow up, there's no way for an adult woman to propose marriage to an adult man with dignity. Right? The best she can do, there's no script. The best she can do is get pregnant and hope he's equally religious. That's all. That's a lady's proposal. <laughs> because if my girlfriend had proposed to me, I wouldn't have taken her seriously. And I know that sounds bad, but it's true, right? Like if I just walked into our apartment one night and she had been like, Josh, will you marry me? I'd be like, yeah, I guess eventually, but why are you bringing that up now? <laughs> And why are you down on one knee like that? Did you lose a contact, or is this some kind of night yoga you've invented? 
Because when a woman takes to her knees like that, right, a dude has a very specific set of pre-existing associations, and they're certainly not, oh good, our two souls are about to be entwined as one for all of eternity. When a woman takes that knee, a dude thinks, I don't know what I did to deserve oral sex here on this horse and carriage ride through Central Park in New York City, but you're very romantic and someday you'll be my bride. You know what? Get up, I'm gonna propose to you. Uh, I will tell you the story of how I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with my girlfriend. And it's, it was a story that happened on a bittersweet day. It was the day of my grandmother's funeral. And we, went up, we took a train up to Massachusetts, where my family is from. And it was a very Massachusetts funeral. Uh, like, I don't, this sounds, that, that sounds like nonsense, but I will prove it. My grandmother was cremated and then buried in a Tom Brady jersey. <laughs> That's a real fan, okay? I see people in New York City all the time walking around in Eli Manning jerseys alive and shit. No, show some respect. Burn it down like Nana did. That's how you get done. <laughs> and the jersey was a gift that I got her when she went into the hospital and was sick, and we hung it on the wall of her hospital room under the TV. And when I heard that she was cremated in it, I started to cry because I'd spent like $100 on that jersey. <laughs> and I was like, we hadn't even looked at the will yet, the price tags were still on it. I guess everyone grieves differently, mom and dad, but I didn't think incinerating possessions was one of the things that was on the agenda. So we, we attend the funeral, we spend all day with family, friends of family, extended family. It's, it's, it's really lovely to have so much support, but it's also exhausting, right? So to expend so much emotional energy. So we go out that night, we decide we're gonna go into the city of Boston, see some old friends, uh, have a couple drinks, kind of lighten the load a little bit. So we borrow my mom's car, and all we have to listen to is terrestrial radio, uh, which in Boston is terrible. I don't know if you guys have ever listened, but it goes up to like 1997, skips forward to the Dropkick Murphys song from the Departed soundtrack, and that's it forever. <laughs> they don't know about Rihanna, it's a nightmare, it's a wasteland. So here's, we turn it on, and the first song we hear is the song Caress Me Down by the band Sublime, which is a terrible song. If you guys don't know Sublime in general, their vibe is kind of like a blacklight Che Guevara poster that you listen to, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> and Caress Me Down is specifically a terrible song. It's a story told in two languages, and that story is a guy fucks a girl, and then he fucks her in Spanish, and then the Spanish time she gets pregnant. And I don't know if that's racist, but it feels racist to me. <laughs> So the song comes on, and my girlfriend starts singing it super loud in my face. Like, as a bit. This isn't where I find out she's a juggalo or something. <laughs> she's just right up in my face. When I see Maxi, he makes me feel horny. Which, first of all, if you're writing a love song and you use the word horny, delete draft, start fresh. <laughs> horny is not a song lyric for a love song. It's what you put in a text message next to an eggplant emoji. We all know that. We're adults. <laughs> So she keeps singing, cause I'm the type of lover with the sensitivity. Kiss me neck and tickle me fancy. Tickle your fancy, what are you, a horny pirate? You need to stop singing or I can't love you anymore. That's the deal. So we go, uh, we go into the city. We meet some friends, we have a couple drinks, no more than the legal limit. We get back in the car to head home. I don't know why you're laughing at exactly what happened. And we turn on the car radio and uh, the first song we hear is Caress Me Down by the band Sublime again. And at that point, I'm like, did we anger a wizard? Has someone put a curse on us? There is no other reason to hear this song twice in one night in this decade. And this time, it's the Spanish part of the song, and my girlfriend doesn't know any Spanish, which I don't know if that's racist, but it feels a little racist to me. So instead of singing, she's just doing this dance where she's shaking her fists in my face like I just denied her a mortgage or something. And... <laughs> It's very funny, I'm laughing a lot. It's like really authentically making my day better. So we get back to my parents' house uh, and we go up the stairs to my childhood bedroom where we're sleeping in two twin beds pushed together, like a couple from a 50s sitcom who almost figured sex out. <laughs> and we, we get into bed and we're spooning. And you know this isn't spooning because I'm standing up. This is just a prom picture, I guess. <laughs> Turn it 90 degrees, spooning. And, <laughs> you guys get it? We're, um, we're, I'm drifting off to sleep. It's been such a long day and it's so late. And I, it's, I just, I'm drifting off. And before I can, my girlfriend murmurs so gently, so sweetly. She says, Josh, kiss my neck. And I say, of course, 
anything you want in the whole world. Kiss your neck, scratch your back, rub your feet, whatever it is, I'm here for you. You've been such a wonderful, beautiful partner to me today and over our whole relationship and anything I can do for you, I will perform gladly to bring you the same kind of comfort and love. So I lean in to give her just the tiniest, gentlest kiss on the back of the neck, just a physical whisper of a gesture. And as I lean in to kiss her neck, she looks back over one shoulder at, at me, makes eye contact with one eye like a shark would, <laughs> and yells in my face, and tickly fancy guys. She caressed me, downed me in my childhood bedroom on the day of my grandmother's funeral. I don't know what they call that where you grew up. In Stone of Massachusetts, where I'm from, they call that a motherfucking keeper, okay? I wanted to propose right then and there. I wanted to, but I held off. I went out the next day and I bought Rosetta Stone and I proposed after she learned all the Spanish lyrics to that song because I'd be goddamned if I married a woman who didn't know all the words to our wedding song. Thank you guys so much. Have a lovely night.